to the name of the Most High God. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, bless the name of the Lord this morning. Shabbat Shalom. I am not going to continue to fuss with YouTube this morning. So tell a neighbor, tell a friend, tell an in-law, tell an outlaw, tell anybody that is out there. They need to just come on over to the conference line. And if YouTube decides that it's going to come back up and do what it do, it'll be what it is. But I got to go ahead and move forward this morning because I know I got a lot to share. Amen. And I knew it was going to be challenging today. I got up early, came into the studio early, thought everything was good to go. And when I go hit the go button, nothing want to go. But amen, I'm going to go anyway. Amen, because I'm going on with the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. He is my strength. Amen. And the joy of the Lord is my strength today. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to the Most High God. Amen. So we will not be stopped. We will not be blocked. We will not be hindered. Amen. We're going to continue to go forth in the power and in the might and in the name of the Most High God. Glory to his name this morning. Amen. Well, Shabbat Shalom and Barak Hashem Yahweh. Peace to all of you this morning. Amen. On the Sabbath, welcome to see Faith Ministries International Fellowship. I'm Apostle Ben. I'm excited to be here with you. Amen. We're going today to start a new series. Amen. Titled Now Hebrews, a reconciled seed in Yeshua, Messiah. And in these lessons, we're going to discuss and learn what it means to be Abraham's seed and the Israel of God. So let us pray, and then we're going into the word of the Lord this morning. Father, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. We thank you because there's none like you in all the earth. How excellent is your name. Your name is great and greatly to be praised. Father, be glorified this morning. Be magnified this morning. Be exalted this morning, Father. Receive all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory that is due your name. I thank you this morning, Father, because there's none like you in all the earth. How excellent is your name. Your name is great and greatly to be praised. Father, despite of everything that's happening and everything that's taking place, we give you all the glory. We lift up your name so that you would draw all men unto yourself. We give you thanksgiving and honor and praise. Oh God, we thank you this morning for waking us up in our right mind. We thank you this morning, oh God, for watching over us as we slept. We thank you for God keeping us, giving your angels charge over us to watch us in all of our ways. And this morning, as we gather together in your name in this place, we thank you for being in our midst this morning. I ask that you would have your way, that you would be glorified, that you would be magnified, that you would be lifted up. And Father, we'd be careful to give you all the thanks all the honor, and all the praise. This we pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. And amen. And amen. Well, bless the name of the Lord this morning. Amen. Well, I'm going forth. Amen. In the Lord this morning, because I've got to get this word out. I've got to share this word. And, you know, I expect the enemy to do what he do and the systems of the world to do what they do. Amen. But we're going to keep doing what we do and what we're called to do. Amen. In the name of the Lord and in the kingdom of the most high God. Well, this morning, shalom and good morning. Welcome to this new series. And we're going to learn what it means to be the seed of Abraham. Abraham and the Israel of God. This is going to be a challenging series. I'm going to tell you that from the onset. It is going to challenge your theology, your doctrine, your stance, your walk with the Lord, and it's intended to because it's time to end the family feuding. It's time to end the debates. It's time to end who's Israel and who's not, who's spiritual and who's not. It's only through a full understanding that we can bring the divided house and the divided people of God together to break down the hatred, the bitterness, the pride, the arrogance of Christendom and Judaism and every other ism and schism that's going on out there and put them to a quick and deserving death. You know, because there's only one solution for the people of God and the body of Christ, and that is to get fully and completely in him and to walk in him. And to stop the feuding and the fighting, stop walking contrary to what it is that the Lord has placed us in the earth to do and to be and start being his kids, start being his children, start acting and walking like his family and realizing that there is no longer Jew or Greek, 
black or white, male or female, that we are all one in Yeshua Messiah. And we're all now Hebrews. We're all now the family of God. We're all now Israel. Hallelujah. And the Messiah has broken down the middle wall of petition. He has broken down every barrier. He has broken down and broke through everything that will try to keep us separate and apart. And no matter what things the enemy tries to erect to be a barrier to our coming together, God is going to have himself a people. Amen. Even if it's a remnant, he, he promised that he's going to have himself a people. Hallelujah. And if you are the people of God this day and you believe that you are one of his, then you ought to say amen. You ought to be excited this morning that you have been called to be a part of the kingdom and to be a part of the family of God. And it's really time for the people of God who name his name and called by his name to start walking according to that that he has said and that that he has promised us and been promised to us. Let's go to Galatians chapter three. I've got quite a bit of ground I need to cover today. So I need to go ahead and get on down the road this morning. So get your Bibles out because you're not able to watch me on the screen this morning. Amen. So get your Bibles out, get your pads and your pencils out so we can go ahead and go deep into this word this morning. I'm going to break down this word this morning now, Hebrews, because it's time for us to come together in Yeshua, the Messiah. But Galatians chapter three, beginning at verse 26, says this, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, folks want to use this scripture, especially female preachers, when it's time to get in the pulpit and preach and all of that kind of stuff. But that's not what this is talking about. We can't take scriptures out of context to justify what we want them to mean when we want them to mean us. We've got to stay within the book and stay within the confines that the book has been given. This is talking about freedom in Yeshua. This is talking about oneness in Meshua. This is talking about sons and heirs of God in the Messiah. This is talking about breaking down those walls and barriers that keep people on the outside when God has called them to be on the inside. That keeps people claiming I'm black and I'm white, I'm Jew and I'm Greek, I'm slave and I'm free. It keeps people from claiming sex, uh huh, and skirmishes and isms and schisms instead of being the seed of Abraham in Christ, in God. And it was through Abraham because Abraham is the father of faith. The Bible said that Abraham mm -hmm, received a good report from the Most High God because he believed God. He believed in him whom he had not seen, yet he believed that he was able to bring him into the promise that he had made. This is in the fulfillment of the promise. This is not a scripture where you get to justify more of your isms and schisms and divisions. This is a scripture given to us by which we realize and understand that we are sons and heirs of the most high God and the promises that he made to Abraham to make him a great nation that all the seed of the earth would be blessed in him. And it's that promise that he made that covenant that I Elohim made to Abraham that Yeshua came in fulfillment of to be the seed that will bruise the head of the serpent, hallelujah, and crush him under our feet so that we could rise above him and walk in the new nature and the new stature of Christ as the son of God to be the heirs, not just of salvation, but of the promises that God, that he has made to the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. And therefore we are now sons of God through that same faith 
in Christ to believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life unto the Father, and that no man can get in except he comes through him. And contrary to most popular definitions of the word Gentile, it is not just someone who is opposite a Jew. It is not just someone who is a Greek, but Gentile is in reference to the nation, the nations who are outside of a covenant and a relationship with the most high God. And Christians has termed it to be given to people other than who it belongs to. Anyone who was outside the covenant and has not received, as we just read in Galatians, Yeshua the Messiah and been baptized into him is considered a Gentile nation, a heathen nation, an unbelieving nation and people. And therefore, he is speaking to those who are on the outside that it is time to get on the inside. And Ephesians, as Paul goes on to talk to these Bible, Bible believing folk and unbelieving folk in the city of Ephesus, he is sharing with them that as a nation of people, they are no longer that nation of unbelieving folks if they have come into Messiah. And if they have believed on the Messiah and received the Messiah now as the propitiation, the Savior for all men. Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, Paul declares the real here. Paul declares that those who got saved, who've accepted Yeshua Messiah, as we just read in Galatians, they are no longer the unbelieving nation. They are no longer a part of the Gentile nation. They have a new identity, and that identity now makes them a citizen in the commonwealth of Israel. Galatians 2, 11 through 13. Let's open our Bibles and go there. But Galatians 2, 11 through 13 says that we are bought near now by the blood of Yeshua. Therefore, remember that you were once. Somebody said, I once was. I know folks keep trying to tell you, you a sinner. You once was a sinner. Hopefully, you ain't still sinning and walking in that sin, but you are walking out of that sin and you're walking as the redeemed. But you are no longer a Gentile in the flesh. You're no longer walking in and of your flesh. And when you come into Messiah and receive Messiah, your flesh should die and you must crucify the flesh. As Paul said, crucify the deeds and the works of the flesh and the lust of the flesh that wants to keep you going back to the former nation that God had delivered you from. He says in verse 11, therefore, remember that you once were Gentiles in the flesh who are called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. In other words, by what, by those who are in the covenant of God made by the flesh of hands, those who had a covenant with God and they were circumcised in order to solidify that covenant with the most high. But those of us who come in, uh-huh, we didn't have that covenant with the most high. We're no longer that once we have received the Messiah, that at the time you were without Christ. So when you were without Christ, you were a Gentile. You were an unbelieving nation. You were a heathen nation. You were a fleshly people. You were a people that walked in their own nature and in their own carnality and in their own way. You're no longer that, my brother. You're no longer that, my sister, if you say you receive Yeshua, the Messiah. You were once aliens uh -huh, from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of the promise. You were once strangers and aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers and aliens from the promises of the covenant, having no hope without God in the world. Those in the world have no hope without God. They're hoping in the systems of man, but they have no hope without God. But now verse 13, it says in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now this is important. And I need you to get this because so many today are still trying to claim their old nature. They're still trying to claim their former, listen, 
their former commonwealth. They're still trying to claim their former residency or citizenship from the kingdom that they've been purchased out of by the blood of Yeshua. He said, don't remember those things. You once were those things. You once were called the uncircumcised. You once were called the heathen nation. You once were the people of the carnal nature and the flesh. But now you have received the Messiah, and therefore you are no longer these aliens. You're no longer foreign aliens, but now you are citizens of the commonwealth of Israel. You're no longer strangers to the covenants and the promises of God because now they are unto you just as they were unto them who were born into them. Anybody with me today? Because so many people who name the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, still want to try to go back to the old thing. You want to go back to being a black one, being a white one, being a this one, being a that one. You got to lay that down, cast that down, kick all that foolishness to the curb if you're going to be what God has called you to be in Yeshua. Once you were not a people and you belong to that nation, now you you are all Israelites. Now you are all Hebrews in the kingdom of God. And we are one reconciled seed in Yeshua, the Messiah. And if the people of God, and if the body of Christ, and if those who claim themselves to be Christians and the like don't get this and don't understand this, you'll continually be vacillating between two opinions, questioning who you are, questioning why you're here, questioning what you're supposed to be doing. And the problem is, is that man-made teachings and teachers that have placed the word spiritual before anything that has to do with the seed, before anything that has to do with the promises, before anything that has to do with this new man and this new nature that we ought to have in Christ and God. We're talking about the seed of Abraham because even Yeshua said you are Abraham's seed. And if ye be the children of Abraham, then you are also heirs to the promises of Abraham. And when we're talking about Abraham's seed, it would seem, it would see in order to make it seem that believers are some kind of spiritual amalgamation. And they're not the physical inheritance that God has promised. And as long as we continue to allow people to spiritualize everything, people won't walk out the natural practices of that that they ought to do in order to receive the spiritual promises. Folks want to be spooky spiritual, but they don't want to walk out the natural practices in order for the spirit to manifest. You can't, listen, have the fruits of the spirit if you don't allow them to operate in and through your life. The spirit just ain't going to make you and force you. And so many folks trying to sit back and say, well, this work been done by the spirit. So I don't have anything to do. I'm going to help you this morning because the worst thing that you can do or allow anybody else to do to you is put the word spiritual before everything that God has made natural to put the word spiritual before that, that has preceded the spirit. And that is the natural. You have to first do the natural things in order for the spiritual manifestations to take place. If you don't believe then the spirit won't heal. If you don't believe, then the spirit won't bless. Come on, somebody. You have to first practice and do something in order for the spirit to activate. He ain't just going to force you and make you. He's already done the work for you, but you have the responsibility to walk in faith to receive that that is already done. And may I remind those teachers and preachers and folks out there that wants to spiritualize everything and add to the word of God that it is a capital offense punishable by death to add anything to God's word. To add anything, every word of God is pure, it says in Proverbs 30 verse 5. Every word of God is pure and it don't need your help. It don't need you trying to help it. Deuteronomy 4, 2 says that you shall not add to the word which the Lord has commanded and given to us. You shall not take away from it, for it is the Lord's commandments which he has commanded you this day to observe. 
And if we keep adding things to the word, taking things away from the word, allowing people to do that because they don't believe, don't want to believe, don't want to practice, then as Yeshua said, we make the word of God of no effect because we hold on to the traditions of man and we put them above the word of the most high. Anybody getting any of the things here? For whosoever testifies, and he testifies to everyone who hears the words of the prophecies of the book. And if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him, he says, the plagues that are written in the book. Revelations 22, verse 18. So if we add things to the word that are not there, if we take away things from the word that are not there, then we add unto ourselves the suffering that God said he had promised those that are disobedient. But apparently there are some who either do not understand, they don't understand these truths, or they don't want you and I to understand these truths, so they desire to suppress them. They desire to keep people ignorant of them. They desire to keep people pushed into a place to where you revert back to the old nature, the old way of living, the old way of doing, the old way of being in order to perpetuate some second class citizenship. Mm -hmm. Because most people are still worshiping in bondage and worshiping in chains because they're worshiping at the thrones of racism and colorism and sexism and all types of isms and schisms instead of worshiping at the foot of the son of the most high God. All people today have a deep seated desire to belong to something to belong to a tribe, to belong to something better, to belong to a cause. But that deep-seated desire is that you would long for the nation of God to be birthed in you. And the yearning that you have should cause you to want for the covenants of God, to convert from pagan religions and beliefs in order to be formed and reformed into the new nature in Christ. Even those who are forcing people to recant their faith in Yeshua and the finished work and adopt other forms of religion and traditions and world systems. They are still seeking for a kingdom, still seeking for a belonging, still seeking for a people. So even if they have to create a people, even if they have to revert back to an old, old or former people, they would rather do that than to remain peopleless. This is why folks join gangs and fraternities and the likes, because they want to belong. They want to be a part. But that longing is that we belong and long to belong to the kingdom of the most high God. Because any other longing to be a part of any other type of society will bring hatred, will bring malice and envy and jealousy and murder because it will rise up against even the very ones that we are called to be with and alongside. It will turn love into hate because it is seeking to be separate and apart. And I'm not talking about unison and exclusism just for the sake of it, because that's what the world is trying to get us to understand. That's what the world is trying to get us to walk in because that's what the world wants us to embrace this universalism without, listen, universalism without the sovereignty of God is still secularism, humanism, occultism, because if it is devoid of the most high as the center, then it is still man's kingdom and it is still building upon the philosophies and the doctrines of man. But know this today. You cannot be a citizen of a spiritual entity known as the church, because that's what they want you to believe. You're a spiritual citizen of the church. Well, the church is the physical body of Yeshua, the Messiah. It's not some spiritual entity that does not exist. It is the physical manifestation here on earth, or I should say should be the physical manifestation here on earth of the presence of the son of God when he was here on earth. It's not just some made up spiritual entity devoid and lack of power and authority, but it is empowered by the spirit 
that the Lord sent in order to empower his people to be him in the earth, to do the same things he did in the earth. For example, in order to be a citizen of the Commonwealth of South Carolina or Florida or Virginia or North Carolina, you have to be a physical being. They want to see you, recognize you, and then give you some documents in order to say you are a resident of that state and then of the nation or the country. You must be recognized by the official government of that state or of that nation in order to be considered a legal resident and to receive the benefits that the state or the nation says that it gives its citizens. You can't be stopped by the policeman when he asks you for your driver's license and you say, sir, I have a spiritual piece of paper that allows me to drive an automobile. He's going to pull you out of that vehicle and said, unless you have a valid driver's license that authorizes you to drive in this state and in any other, I'm going to lock you up and arrest you and confiscate your vehicle because you are driving dirty. You are driving illegal. If he asks you for your identification and you say, sir, I have a spiritual birth certificate. It doesn't exist in this world, it's, it's, you know, but you can see it if you got eyes into the spirit. He's going to pull you out of the car and then probably call some psychiatrists and say, I got a crazy person here telling me they got some, some spiritual documents that I can't see, but only they can see. But I need a driver's license or identification card so I can prove your legal residence. In order for us to be in the kingdom of God, we must show physical proof that we are a part of that kingdom. We can't just say in word and not walk out in deed that we are a part of the kingdom of the most high God. And too many believing folks want to do that. They want to claim and spiritual inheritance, but then they have no physical manifestations that are recognized by both the legal government and the illegal government that operates its principalities in this world. And principalities are powers and rulers and authority of both the dark and the known world. So we can't just say, Mr. Policeman, I got a made up document no more than we can say, Satan, I got a made up right to be here. We have to show physical proof and evidence. Here's why the demons that jumped on the sons. Uh huh. My goodness, help me up in here. Holy Ghost that jumped on the sons of Sceva did not recognize their legal authority and basis for them to operate. They tried to use someone else's credentials. They said, well, I adjure you in the name of the God Paul served. And the demon responded back and says, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know, but you, I don't recognize because I don't recognize the legal authority because you're not based in nor governed in any legal kingdom. Y'all not talking to me up in here. You're trying to exercise rights and privileges and authority of someone else, but you have none of your own. Here's why for some of you who's still trying to ride on your wife's coattail, your husband's coattail, your brother's coattail, your sister's coattail ain't going to get you in. You got to have your own physical proof and evidence that you are a part of the commonwealth of God, that you exist in the kingdom of God. And you begin that process by first confessing with your mouth and then believing with your heart and then walking on into practicality through your works and your actions that you belong to the higher kingdom and not keep vacillating between the lower order. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. Because in order for former Gentiles, who by virtue of their acceptance now of Yeshua Messiah, have become physical citizens of the house and the commonwealth of Israel. They have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness and planted now in the kingdom of Yeshua the Messiah. They have become a part of the household of faith and the commonwealth of God, and they are physical people and physical beings now in that kingdom that can exercise all of the spiritual rights and privileges and receive of the same. Because Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter 14 as he continues to explain to them this commonwealth 
and this responsibility now to walk in this new citizenship and to walk as these residents, these legal residents, not illegal aliens, not folks who are trying to force their way in and buy their way in, but people who have entered in legally, and now they can walk in the legal and authority that that kingdom operates in, so the things that they were subject to in the former kingdom no longer has the power against them nor over them in the new kingdom. And Paul goes on in verse 14 of Ephesus as he continues to help these people to understand this inheritance that they now have. He says here, for he himself, who he, Yeshua himself is our peace. He has become the peace between us and God who was angry with all evildoers, the Bible says. But now Yeshua has become our peace and he has made us both what? One. He has made us one. We trying to be one. We trying to fight cause us to be one. Folks trying to create laws and things to make folk want to be one. That ain't going to make folks want to be one if they haven't choose to be one with you. But Yeshua has made the peace with the most high God so that we now have become one and he's broken down the middle wall of separation. He's broken down anything that would separate us from the love of God. He's broken down anything that would keep us separate from what God has promised and given us. He has abolished, listen, he has abolished in his flesh the enmity, the enemy, the animosity, the anger that God law brings against us for disobeying his commandments and his ordinances. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And any man who say he has no sin, John says, is a liar. Because we were all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. But it is true the shed blood of the one who is the obedient that he's washed away that sin. He's covered that sin. So the father no longer sees us, but he sees the righteousness of Yeshua. And therefore he has created in himself one Somebody say one, one new man, not multiple, not separate, not 3,000 denominations of men. He has created in himself one new man from two. We're no longer two nations. We're no longer two people. We're no longer separate and apart. He has created us to be one new man making peace that he might reconcile both to God in one body. There's only one body of Yeshua Messiah. They ain't multiple bodies. They ain't a Baptist body, a Pentecostal body. They ain't a Christian body and a Jewish body. They ain't a Christian body and a Catholic body. There is one body of Yeshua Messiah, therefore putting to death the enmity. Because if we don't become one body, the death of the enemy, the death of the anger, the death still lives and will continue to live and will always live as long as we're not one. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off to those who were near. For, for through him, we both have access by one spirit to the father. So if the father isn't many, if the father and the son aren't many and they are one, we too are one. We too are called to be one. And he, that is what he came to preach. That is the peace that he came to bring. That is the people he came to speak to who were far off that he wants to draw near, that he wants to bring near. For through him, we now have this access to the Father through the Spirit. And as we said in our last teaching, you must be born again, not just of the Word, not just of the blood, but also of the Spirit. You must be baptized in the Spirit of the Most High God in order to have his Spirit. To walk in his spirit. You're not his spirit if you're still living and doing the deeds of your old flesh and your old nature. You don't have his spirit. You can't say you have his spirit and you're still doing the carnal works of your flesh. You don't have his spirit. Yeshua didn't keep on sinning. He never sinned in the beginning. He never sinned in the middle. He never sinned in the end. He was full of the spirit. He walked in the spirit. The Bible said he was without sin. And I know folks say, oh, we can't be Jesus. We can't walk like it should. We can't, we can't be that. Listen, we got to strive to be as close to it as possible. That's our work. 
Our work is to strive to enter into the straight gate, the narrow way. Our work is to beat this flesh down and to beat this body down so that it comes into subjection unto the will of the most high God. Our job is what? As Paul said, to continually beat this flesh, to get it down, to get it to obey. Because the flesh don't want to obey. The carnal mind don't want to submit. We have to renew our mind by the word is what the scripture said. You can't have a renewed mind if you don't spend no time in the word. You don't spend no time. I'm not saying just trying to find out something to justify your point or your opinion, but to study to show yourself approved unto God. And Paul continues in verse 19 of Ephesus. He says, now, therefore, knowing this and having this, having this understanding, because until you get this understanding, you're going to keep walking in the old nature. You're going to keep walking in the old man. But now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And he's talking about the saints that have gone on. He's not talking about the saints that the Catholic Church done made saints. He's not talking about folk who think they're walking down here as saints. He said you are now a part of that kingdom, part of that citizenship, part of that commonwealth, you've maintained and gained that inheritance with the saints who've gone on before you, and now you become members of the household of God. You are recognized now as part of that family and that kingdom. You're no longer foreigners and strangers. You are foreigners and strangers down here because Scripture said this world is not our home. We're just sojourners or we're just passing through. We're foreigners and strangers down here because our home is in another place. This is why Abraham received a good report from God because it said that he had not yet obtained the kingdom, but yet he believed God was able to bring him into that inheritance. And if we are now part of the fellow citizenship with the saints and members of God's household, having been built up on the same foundation, of the apostles and the prophets with Yeshua the Messiah himself being the chief cornerstone. There can't be no other foundation except that that is already laid. And that that the apostles and the prophets that have gone before has laid as to how this house is to be built and how this house is to be entered into and how you are to obtain citizenship in this house. You can't come in some way that the church has created. You can't come in some way that the preacher has created. You can't come in some way that the latest denomination has created. You must come in through the way that has already been made, that has already been paid, that has already been foretold. And that is what the apostles and the prophets said that should be. This is how you got to get in. You can't get in in no other way. Folks trying, folks show trying to kick the dough in and kick the dough down. But you got to come in because it's laid on that foundation. And Christ is the cornerstone of that house and we can't remove him. In whom the whole building is fit together, grows. And when we build on the foundation that's already been laid, we connect to the stone and the corner that's already been set. Then the whole house begins to be joined and built and fit together and grows into a holy temple. Grows into a holy, not an unholy. Folks saying they're Christian and they're unholy. Folks saying they're believers and they're unholy. You're not growing into holiness in the Lord. His people should be growing into holiness in him. His place of worship should be a holy place of worship, not a den of thieves, not a place of whoremongers and vagabonds, not to stay. They come in that way, but they don't stay. Preachers today said it's okay if you come in that way, stay that way, it's cool, the Lord loves you anyway. No, we're not a holy temple if we let you stay that way when you enter into the family of God. We can't let you stay the way that you were if you enter into the household of God. you got to become holy to be a part of the holy lump because a little leaven, Listen, a little unleavened leavens the whole lump. And if I let your little bit of sin come connect to my holiness, you're going to corrupt my entire loaf. Because in him, in whom you are also built together for a dwelling place 
of God in the spirit. And we know God dwells in no unholy thing. God does not live in darkness. God does not live in unrighteousness. God does not live in any of the darkness of this age. He is light. And if we're being built up together as a place where he can dwell, he's not dwelling in den of thieves. He's not dwelling in places of whoremongering. He's not dwelling in places of idol worship. He's not dwelling in places of darkness. Not the spirit of the most high God. There is no darkness in him. There is no shadow of turning in him. There is none of that in him. How can we say God is there and God is here and this is God's house and it's a place and a den of thieves. It's a house of wickedness. It's a house of irrepute. It's Ichabod written on the house. The glory of the Lord has departed. Folks saying the Lord is here. The Lord ain't in there. If all types of evil and wickedness is going on, God's spirit is not in there. You may have a spirit in there. You may have another spirit in there, but it's not the spirit of the most high God that only dwells in holiness. He said, be ye holy for I am holy. What you don't understand about that. And I don't mean you walking around with a doily on your head and a white dress down to your ankles. Holiness is sanctification and being set apart, touching not the unclean thing, touching not the forbidden thing, touching not the dark thing, but remaining separate from it. Come out and be ye separate, saith the Lord. But the people of God don't want to come out and be separate. They want to still hold on. They want to still be a part of man's thing. They want to still be a part of what man got going on. They want to still be a part of the old order and the old system and the old hatred and all of that kind of stuff. You can't keep embracing that stuff and expect to walk in the kingdom. Citizenship has always been and will always be something that you physically do in order to be a part of. If you're going to be a part of the kingdom of God, you must walk in the kingdom of God. You must act like a citizen of the kingdom of God. You must exercise the rights and the privileges given to you. You must manifest those. But some people want to keep trying to get in any way that they can. Buy their way in, enter in illegal, break their way in, ride their way in, kick their way in. There's only one way in. And Yeshua says, I'm the way. He said, if you try to get in any other way, using any other means, even by force, he said, you a thief. And you a robber. And if the thief be caught, he's going to pay for his thievery. He said in John 10, 1 through 13, powerful. Because we always read John 10 and 10, the thief come to steal, kill, and destroy. Yeah, that's wonderful. We know that. Yeshua said, but I came to give you life, and I came to give you life abundantly. He said, but people can't have life and can't have the abundant life because they keep trying to act like their father, the devil, and steal and kill. They keep trying to push their way in and force their way in. And the kingdom of God is suffering violence and so much violence that the violent men are trying to force their way into it. But I'm here to tell you, you can't get in any other way. He said in John 10, verse 1, he started off in verse 1, long before we get to 9 and 10. He said in verse 1, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door. Stop right there. Highlight that in your Bible. Pause. Take a breath. Say Selah for a minute. He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door. First of all, you sheep and you got to come in through the door. Sheep don't jump the fence. Sheep don't crawl under the fence. Sheep don't escape out the sheep pen. Sheep come in through the door. They are obedient. They follow the shepherd. And if they slip and if they fall, it is due to a mistake that they made, an enemy that pulled them away, and the shepherd goes find them and bring them back. But sheep are obedient and they follow. So he said, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief, and a robber. And that's what we have today in so-called Christendom and the church where we got a lot of thieves and we got a lot of robbers who trying to jump the fence, flip the fence, kick the fence, bust down the fence. Come on, dig a new fence, create a new way. When he says, I'm standing right here, Yeshua says, I'm standing right here. I am the door. 
And if you want into here, you got to come through me. Well, I don't want to face him. I don't want to deal with him. You hear people all the time, well, I ain't ready to come to God yet. I ain't ready to deal with my stuff. Then you can't get in no other way. You're going to be on the outside still looking, still waiting to get in. You, you can't try to, listen, fake your way into this. Ain't no Listen, ain't no faking it till you make it. Not when it comes to the kingdom of God. You can't fake it till you make it. You either in or you out. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. I'm the door and I'm coming through the way and making the way. I'm the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper, the father is the doorkeeper. So the shepherd has to also come in through the same door. Y'all ain't getting this. The shepherd has to also come in through the same door because the father who is the doorkeeper opens the door for all of his sheep to come in that hear his voice and call his own sheep by name and leads them out. This is why Yeshua said, I have other sheep from other foes that you do not know, and I must bring them in also. Y'all ain't the only ones. I got more that I got to bring in. This is why I am the door. Because I know who need to get in. I know who the Father has ordained to get in. So therefore, I got to go get them because they don't even know they supposed to be in here. I got some people out there who don't even know yet they supposed to be in here. But if you my sheep, you're going to be okay with that. Because even if they don't look like you, y'all ain't talking to me. Even if they don't sound like you, come on. E listen, even if they don't, listen, appear to be the same color as you. I got sheep I need to bring in here that my father knows because they are all my father's sheep. And I got to bring them in. I got to go get them. And bring them home. And Yeshua is bringing God's sheep home. He's bringing the father's sheep to the father's house. Why? Because the father called them. And he's calling them from near and from far. And the Bible said that he is calling them from the four corners of the earth. To come in to his house. So that his house may be full. He told Yeshua, told his disciples. He said, go out. I've invited people to the banquet. I've blown the trumpet. I've sound the alarm, but they won't come. So you know what? Go out into the hedges and the highways and the byways and compel men to come. Tell them to come to the banquet of the Lord. And they said they went out and they got the lame, the halt, the main, everybody, and invited them in. Why? Because Yeshua's the shepherd. And he's got to bring in all all of God's sheep because the ones that he's invited, they refuse to come. They think they got time. They think it's not important right now. They don't think they need to enter in. Oh, I'll get in there whenever I'll say my deathbed confession and everything will be cool. That's not guaranteed. Cause in Galatians three, as we've already read, Paul uses, or I should say the Greek uses a term, when it talks about the seed of Abraham. And although it differs a little, not much, in the Hebrew, the word seed here has the same connotation in that it is a part of a reproductive process. And in Galatians 3, where Paul talks about us being the seed of Abraham, it is the same word that is used in the book of Genesis when it says Yeshua would be the seed of the woman that bruises the head of the serpent. That same seed, that seed that's being brought forth, that one seed, that righteous seed. And the word that is used here in the Greek comes from the word sperma, where we get the word sperm. And if you don't understand that, then you need to pull you out an anatomy book and a biology book and understand that because sperm ain't spiritual. Sperm is natural. Sperm produces life. Sperm produces the seed. And believers who are born again and reborn and brought out of that Gentile heathen unbelieving nation are of the seed of Abraham. They fell off and fell away and became unbelieving. 
but they are of the seed. They were born and birthed from the seed. And that seed didn't just begin with Abraham. The promise was made to Abraham, but it began in the rebirth of the nation through Noah. So that seed came in from the family of the sons of Noah, from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They were the progenitors and the procreators of the new world after the flood. And it was that seed that repopulated the earth. So all men are of that same righteous seed. All men. I don't care if they're black, white, yellow, brown. They are all from that same seed because that family repopulated the earth. And God said through Abraham, I'm going to now use you in order to bring all that seed back, back home. Bring all that seed back to its rightful place and position, and position in me to where they once were all my children. Because all the earth is the Lord's and all they that dwell therein. They're all his seed. And the word that is used here where we get the English word, the Greek word sperma, where we get the English word sperm, there's nothing spiritual about that. That's a natural seed. This born. So God is bringing all his children back unto himself and desires that all of his children come back unto himself. What's spiritual about sperm? That's not spiritual. That's physical. And whether we want to recognize it or acknowledge it or not, the pigmentation of one's skin doesn't determine their natural birth or heritage. And there was a study done, and I tried to find it. I can't locate it. I probably got it deep buried down in my archive. But all the way back, they had finally did a study to, to determine that all DNA can be traced back to the sons of God, to the first son of God. And it's all one. It is all one blood. And God has created us from all one man and made us all one blood. And then he sent the man Yeshua here to do that that Adam failed to do, and that was keep men united in the Father, to stay separate and apart from what the enemy was seeking and attempting to do in the fall of Adam, to deceive man, to continue to bow down and worship at the false idols of the fallen one and not walk into the nature of the risen one and the obedient one. Therefore, if you belong to Messiah through the new birth, and you've named the name of Christ and you've accepted him as Lord and Savior, you have a responsibility to walk as such. Regardless of whom you think you are or think you were, you are Abraham's seed. You're the righteousness of God. You are part of the family of God. And that's why Paul could say in Galatians, if you really understand this, you'll stop trying to claim I'm Jew, I'm Greek, I'm black, I'm white, I'm man, I'm female. He says, we are all men, and a woman is just a male man with a womb. Yes, you're wonderfully and beautifully made, and thank God for it. But he still calls you a son. He still calls you a son. We're all the sons of God. And Abraham's physical seed has been redeemed has been reconciled back to God and known as the new nation of God. That is the new Zion that he is coming for. That is the new people that he is coming for. That is the ecclesia and the kahila, the called out body of the most high God that he said he's coming back for without a spot, without wrinkle, without no darkness and blemish in them, without no sin in them. He's not coming back for what we have today and the church think, oh, God is coming back for us. Not in the condition and the state that you're in. He ain't coming back for that. That's not what he's coming to gather. He's coming to gather holy and a righteous people, even though they may have to come through, through suffering, through hardship. For many will enter into the kingdom through suffering and hardship, the scripture says. And if you say that you're a believer in Yeshua, Messiah, but you're still vacillating between the kingdoms of this world, you're still wrestling with your identity, with your color, with your stature, then you're basing your freedom in the wrong kingdom. You're basing your rights in the wrong kingdom. You're seeking to get your identity from the wrong kingdom. Your identity has already been given to you in Christ and God. He's already determined who you are and what you should be. Colossians 1, 13 through 14 said that he violently rescued us. 
He plucked us out. He translated us. He transferred us into the kingdom of his son. He rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, from the kingdom of the enemy, from the old former life and the former kingdom, the fallen kingdom, the fallen state, the fallen nature. He rescued us from that kingdom. And he transferred us. He translated us. He plucked us up violently and put us into the kingdom of his dear son and purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Christ purchased our freedom. Or emancipation, proclamation, or anything else Robert E. Lee did or anybody in the Confederate War. That isn't what made me free. The Son of God has made me free. And if you made any man free, you are free indeed. Because if the Son has made you free, then you are truly free. And man can't bind you. Man can't hold you. Man can't restrict you. Folks looking for the world and the world system to validate your freedom. God has already given you the freedom in him. And it's time that God's true people recognize that and understand that and walk in that. You can't walk in the fullness of what he has for you if you're not willing to walk in what he's already paid for you and the price he's already given to you. Again, Galatians 1:13 and 14, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. So we're still no longer down here. We're still no longer children of this world. We're children of the world to come. We're citizens of that kingdom. We walk in that order. We walk under that mandate. And it's time God's people understand that and get that and embrace that and walk in that. It's time for God's true people who call his name, who seek his face, who bow their knee to him to get in and stay in the kingdom and remain there and not vacillate, go back and forth, go in and out and up and down and let the world and the system of the world keep you on some roller coaster ride. It's time for the remnant of God to arise and stop bowing to the gods of this world, to the lusts and the pleasures of this world. Because when Yahweh's sons finally get it and they begin to believe and they begin to walk and they begin to embrace their new nature in him and walk in the new revelation and understand, understanding that they are part of the physical as well as the spiritual inheritance as Hebrew Israelites. And I'm not talking about that black movement because they understand a kingdom. They understand being a nation, but they, like many others, only seek the color of the skin, only seek the color of the skin. The kingdom of God is for all men because all are sons of God. The ones that we hate on, they hate on us. They still sons of God created in his image and in his likeness, but they walked away. They looked into the mirror and forgot the matter of who they are and who they were created to be. And they be embrace the darkness and the dark side instead of walking and remaining in the light. And when Yahweh's sons get this understanding and they walk like Israel, they talk like Israel, they become what God said will be in the end, and that is all Israel will be saved. They would return to honoring him on his Shabbats, acknowledging him on his Moedim, his holy times and holy days. They would recognize the significance of what they mean for them as believers. They would practice Aliyah, and they would return home, and they would come to the high place. They would come to the mountain to work. They would cease from war and angers. They would, listen, prune their, their spears and beat their spear hooks and, 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 and cleavers into weapons of peace and not destruction. And the body of Christ that was supposed to be the arm in the earth, that was supposed to be Yeshua in the earth, that was responsible 
for reconciling men back unto him has gotten in the same cahoots with the same people and done the same deeds that they've done. We can't be the light and be the example doing the same thing that the world does. Operating the same way the world does. Operating under the same confines and constrictions that the world does. This is why we can't pick sides. You're going to have to catch me on Tuesday because I'm going to talk about we can't pick sides. We're going to be righteous. We have to be righteous all the time. If we're going to seek justice, we have to seek justice in all things. We can't pick and choose the things that we get involved in and don't get involved in. We have to stand continually and consistently on the side of righteousness, which is the side of God. And if he's against it, we're against it. If he love it, we love it. If he hate it, we hate it. We can't say we're with God and then we're fighting against him with causes and things that are contrary to him by people who are contrary to him. And yet we say the cause is just, even though the people are unjust. My Bible tells me that even when the cause is just and the people are unjust, so is the cause. Righteousness exalts a nation. And sin is the reproach of any people. It's time to end the feuding and the fighting and the debating as to who you are, whose child you are. It's time now to be Hebrew, to be the kingdom and the family of God. And this is the understanding that God has been trying to get to us for millennia. Get us to understand that Yeshua came to bring us back into oneness, oneness with the Most High, bring all of his people back home. The church that is continuing to embrace humanism, popularism, secularism, is going to go after the world and fall into the traps that the world has laid and set. And this is why Scripture calls and says, to God's people continually come out from among them, come out from among them and be ye separate. And I will receive you saith the Lord. It's time to come out and it's time to come home. It's time to embrace your true identity. And I'm not talking about some blonde haired, blue eyed man that they call Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the son of the living God, Yeshua, Hamashiach, who God has created in the form and the fashion of man, but not to be man, not to resemble how man resembled, but to resemble how the most high resemble. And if we get to know the creator, we get to understand his creation and know what he has created us to be and how he has created us us to walk Judah and the sons of Jacob must reconcile brother hating on brother brother killing brother brother slandering brother it's time for that to stop we are one and we're now all Israel we're now all Hebrews we're now all the sons of God and when we return, we're going to look at breaking down barriers of tribalism. Because for generations, brother has been fighting brother. Brother has been killing brother. Brother has been jealous of brother. Brother has been murdering and slandering brother. But God says it's time to break that down and truly be brothers. If it wasn't for Joseph's brothers hating on him, seeking to kill him, and selling him off. We would have never had the rest of the children of Israel to be able to come down to Egypt when there was famine in the land and their family was almost wiped out. Sometime, our fallen brothers are the very ones God will use to pave a way for us if we're able to reconcile. Jacob never went back and reconciled with Esau. He would have never become the great nation that he became. 
It is time for reconciliation. And we can only reconcile by the spirit of the most high because we need his love. We need his power to love when our flesh and our humanity wants to hate. We need the love of God that is only birthed by his spirit in order to help see through the lies, the anger, the hatred, the mistrust, so that we can be the people of God and the family of God. The day we're living in and the things that we're going through are going to push us either closer or push us farther apart because people are going to have to make a decision. They have to choose ye this day who they're going to serve. And I hope you have made up in your mind to make the wise choice and to choose life, which means to choose God, because he set this day before you a door, a door of life and a door of death. And he said, but choose life so you may live. And I pray that you're going to choose life. Well, I hope to see you again next week. I pray we'll be able to get things up and working. We'll do some testing this week and see what happens and go from there. If not, we'll make some other arrangements to do something differently. So I want to thank God for you guys being here today, listening today, uh, coming into the phone line. We'll have uh, whatever we were able to capture and record up a little later. Uh, God say the same. Uh, if not on YouTube, it will be in the Sea Faith Ministry mobile app. You can always download the mobile app and get access to all of our previous teachings and lessons there as well. Amen. But I hope you've got something out of this teaching today. Now, Hebrews, a reconciled seed in Yeshua, Messiah. Because if we don't see ourselves as one seed in God, reconciled through Christ, we'll be all over the place with our beliefs, with our understanding. And this is what has happened to the body of Christ called the church of the living God. It no longer looks like him nor represents him. It looks more like the world. It looks more like a club. It looks more like a fact. It looks more like a sect than it does his kingdom. And it's time to get into the kingdom. So I pray the day that God will give you understanding and will open your mind and illuminate your heart to see and to know and to understand what has been freely given to us by God the Father. I pray that the Lord continue to watch between me and thee while we're absent one from another. I pray that he continue to watch over us and keep us in all of our ways, I pray that the blood of Yeshua continue to guard us and protect us, to keep us from all hurt, harm, and danger, all sickness and disease. I pray that by the power of the Spirit, we would be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, that we would go out and we would do exploits. I pray that our voices will be lifted high and that we would cry aloud and spare not and warn the people of their sins, that we would show the love of God that we will embrace people unlike ourselves to show them the kingdom of God, that they might walk in the light of his truth, walk in the light of his love. I pray that your path be paved with peace, that there be nothing broken and nothing missing and nothing lacking in your house, that you have sufficiency in all things. I pray where there be lack and shortage, that the God that giveth us all things freely to enjoy will cause you to have all things that you need in this life and the next. Pray that your mind would be renewed by the power of the word of God and that you would walk in the new life and the resurrection of Yeshua, the Messiah, in power and might and authority. And everywhere that you go, I pray that you bring the healing power of the Most High to heal the sick, to set the captives free, to bind up the brokenhearted, to loose those who are shackled and bound, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This is my prayer for you today. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, and be gracious unto you, and grant unto you his peace. Until I see you again, shalom and shalom. God bless. 
take care. Come on over to the conference line and say hello if you're there. I'll be right there with you here in just a moment. Amen. We love you. We appreciate you. We thank God for you. All our family, partners, and friends, we love you. We're praying for you, and we're so grateful and thankful for you. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. God bless, and shalom, and shalom.